Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And be sure and check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up your Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt. If you want just a regular Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt, just go to t-shirt.greatdetectives.net. We also have our uh, Yours Truly Johnny Dollar uh, anniversary t-shirt available at yourstruly.greatdetectives.net and our Joe Friday Never Said Just the Facts Ma'am t-shirt available at friday.greatdetectives.net. But now it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date, January 23rd, 1953. And the title is The Marigold Matter. From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Dollar, my name's Younger. Lieutenant Walt Younger. I'm with the Marigold Police. Marigold Police? I guess maybe you never even heard of my little town. About 50 miles to the north... Oh, oh yeah, sure. I understand you're a pretty good friend of Joe Hickey's, Mr. Dollar. Joe Hickey? Yeah, I know Joe. He used to do a little work for me now and then. That all? Yeah. Why? Joe was killed last night, Mr. Dollar. Shot to death. Found his body this morning. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Younger. Anything I can do? If you could get away for a couple of hours and come on up here, we'd sure appreciate it. Sure, I'll come up, Mr. Younger. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Chief of Police, Marigold, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Marigold matter. Expense account item one, two dollars, bus fare and incidentals, Hartford to Marigold, which turned out to be a little village settled in a sloping valley that was white and clean with fresh snow. A local citizen in galoshes and sheepskin jacket told me that the building that looked like a bookshop was the police station. And sure enough, it was. And two men who looked like anything but policemen greeted me. Hello, Mr. Dollar. I'm Walt Younger. I talked to you on the phone. Sure. And I'd get here. Sergeant Cherry. Mr. Dollar. Sergeant Cherry. Have a chair. Thanks. When I serve you to meet Mr. Dollar. What about Joe Hickey? Well, sir, he's been murdered. We don't know why... Well, who did it? How well did you know him, Mr. Dollar? Oh, he did some legwork for me when he lived in Hartford. I see. Uh, here. This was on him. It's for you. What? We found it on his body. Go ahead, open it. What's it say? Hi, Johnny. How are you? Good, I hope. I'm in the loan business up here now. You ought to come to see me. Besides, there are some funny things going on. And I could use some help from you for a change. Could you come up and give me a hand? Regards, Joe Hickey. Dated yesterday. Guess he never got to mail it. Yeah. When did you hear from him last? Oh, it must be two years anyway. Any idea why anybody would kill him? No, none at all, Sergeant. Well, neither have we, Mr. Dollar. But we want to talk to you before anybody. With that letter and all, it looked like a pretty good place to start. Well, I'm sorry I'm not more help, Lieutenant. Wish I were. Would you like to be? Yeah, I would. Cherry and I are the only cops on the Marigold Force outside of four kids we got in uniform. We've never had a murder here, Mr. Dollar. We don't have a lot of facilities for this kind of thing in my little town. Well, if that letter had been mailed, I'd probably be here right now anyway, Mr. Younger. Hickey was a nice little guy. I'd like to help. So 
Sergeant Cherry stayed at the station while Lieutenant Younger and I drove out in the cold, crisp day to the scene of the murder. A bend in the road about a mile out of town. Found his car parked over there. Passed by, saw it, and reported it. Uh Uh-huh. I figure he drove out with whoever killed him. Could he have met the killer here? Well, no prints in that snow over there. Of course, snow's awful dry, and the wind blowing, tracks could be covered, too. Wind enough to cover a gunshot, you think? I think so, yeah. What did you find on him? Everything. It wasn't robbery, it was something else. Maybe revenge. How's that? Well, I don't know, Mr. Dollar. Joe Hickey was in the loan business. He might have made some enemies. Can you think of any offhand? No. Not yet. Can you? No. Any old ones over in Hartford? Not that I know of. Bullets came in at close range. He must have trusted whoever did it. Where's the body? The morgue. Waiting for an autopsy. Now, if I was a big city force, I'd have all that done already. And I'd have a lot of questions to ask a lot of people. But I don't have anything yet. Kind of like to peek around first and see just what kind of questions I'll want to ask when I do ask him. Well, maybe that's the best way, Lieutenant. Who saw him last? His wife. I talked to her. Ever met her? Once or twice, yeah. How'd you like to meet her again? I didn't want to particularly, but I had a feeling that old Walt Younger wanted me to. He waited for me in the car as I went in to see Joe Hickey's widow. She'd aged a bit since my days, but not too much. It was sweet of you to come all the way out here, Johnny. I'm glad you're here. It's nice to see you again, Pat. I'm sorry the circumstances are what they are. Johnny, I can talk to you, can't I? I'm sure, Pat. What is it? Oh, I feel so awful. Joe and I hadn't been exactly hitting it off lately. I'd... Oh, I'd been thinking of divorcing him for some time. Uh-huh. Would he give you one? Well, no, not exactly. Oh, stop it, Johnny. Don't look at me like you're a policeman or something. You don't think I had anything to do with killing him, do you? I didn't say that. Well, you looked it. Well, I didn't mean to. Just that I haven't seen him for a couple of years, and all of a sudden he's been murdered. So I'm here asking about it. Johnny, he was my husband. And a second ago, you were telling me you were thinking of divorcing him. Did you love him? I didn't love him. I didn't hate him. Don't, Johnny. Not to me. Where were you last night, Pat, while he was out being killed? Here, alone. He left about 8 o'clock and said he had some business to attend to. He never came back. Anybody call you? Anybody drop in and see you, Pat? No. Did he happen to tell you why he was sending for me? No. Did he mention my name at all? No. Johnny. What? I've done nothing wrong. I'm sorry, Pat. I didn't think you'd mind the questions from me. Well, I do. Somebody's going to have to ask them sooner or later. I'd rather it wasn't you. I thought you were my friend. I am. And I was Joe's friend. Please go. Okay, Pat. Well, that didn't take long. Not very pleasant, huh? No. Murder never is. Come on, get in. Am I doing your dirty work for you, Lieutenant? Well, now it all depends on how you look at it. For me or for him, either one. This stuff's got to be done. Only so many people in this town and one of them killed him. Left him there in the cold snow. I'd like to know who it is. Yeah, so would I. Well, what now? You just talked to the nearest of kin. Last one to see him alive. I was hoping you'd map out the next move. Who do you work with? He had a girl helping him in the office. Maybe she can help us. Maybe she can. Her name was 
Vivian Asher. And like most of the people in town, she'd heard about the murder, was frightened about it, and didn't want to talk too much about it. What? I said, can you think of anybody who might have wanted to kill Joe Hickey? Everyone makes friends and enemies. Tell me about his enemies. You'll find that out for yourself, Mr. Dollar. You worked with him. You were around him all the time. Did you ever hear anybody... No. No, I didn't. Did you know that he was worried about some situation here and that he'd written to me? No. Did you like him yourself? Yes. Anything else? Don't be ridiculous. Hmm. How long did you work for him? Two years. Did he treat you well? Fine. He got along fine. And incidentally, I didn't kill him. I was at the Shamrock Grill last night, from about 8 until 1. People saw me there. Oh. You're pretty efficient, after all. I try to be. I wish you'd loosen up on those people in town he didn't get along with. It would help a lot. All right. What? I'll go through his files. Anyone there I can recall him arguing with or not getting along with, I'll make a note. Fair enough. Fair enough. I can't guarantee it'll be a complete list. I'd appreciate anything. Well, give me an hour. I could think of a lot more questions I wanted to ask her, but I was more anxious to see what kind of list she'd get up for me. And it was pretty impressive. About 35 names and addresses. Lieutenant Younger took one half, and I took the other. After two hours of plotting through the snowy streets of Marigold and interviewing a dozen people, I was convinced that all 35 hated Joe Hickey because he'd been pressing them for loan payments. An occupational hazard, I guess. But I was also convinced that none of them hated him enough to kill him. However, when I chanced into the Shamrock Bar and Grill... I met a man who was not on my list. Teal. Jim Teal's the name. Sure, I knew Joe Hickey. What about him? Trying to find out who killed him. Oh, yeah? You don't seem much interested, Mr. Teal. Why should I be? He was a bum when he was alive. Being dead doesn't make him any better. Yeah, you've got a point there. But why was he a bum when he was alive? Lousy shark. That's what he was, a thief. Did he steal from you? <laughs> he tried to. Yeah? When was this? Why, just last week. He came to me with a paper and said that I owed him 235 bucks on my car. He said I had to pay it or he'd take my car away from me. I told him he was crazy. Well, if you owed him the money, he wasn't stealing. You don't get it, fella. I didn't owe him any money, not a dime. What? I paid off that loan months ago. You're just trying to pull something, that's all. Other people tell you the same thing. I've talked to quite a few others. None of them have told me anything like this. Then you haven't talked to enough people. What did you do when he tried to repossess your car? I told him to get away or I'd take care of him. And what happened? I hit him. Did I remember Joe? He was about 140, dripping wet. What are you, uh, 180? Eighty-seven, mister. And it was all my pleasure. Yeah. Especially when he came back a couple of hours later. He told me it was all a mistake. Imagine that, Squirt. Doing his best to beat me out of some money, then coming back and apologizing for it when he couldn't get away with it. Ever occur to you that he had made a mistake? What loan company makes a mistake? They invented bookkeeping. <laughs> Mr. Teal glowered a few long seconds, chewed on a toothpick, and let me know more of what he thought of Joe Hickey as a person. I'm afraid I wasn't listening too closely to what he had to say because I was still thinking of what he'd already said about the matter of bookkeeping. I decided I'd like to talk to Vivian Asher once more. Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember Mr. Hickey did argue with him. He wasn't on the list you gave me. Well, I told you it wouldn't be complete. I'm sorry. Okay. Did you think of any others? No. Would it be possible for me to see the file on Jim Teal? Why? 
I'd like to know what it was all about. I can tell you. Well, tell me then. I made a mistake. Mr. Hickey thought it was a collection. That's all. When he came back to the office, I told him about it. Doesn't it seem reasonable that such a thing could happen? Yeah. Or doesn't that policeman's mind of yours think that people can be human beings? I'm no policeman, Vivian. You're acting like one. Funny. Second person who's told me that since I've been here. I'll have to see those files. Do you have a search warrant? I suppose I can get one. Well, why don't you do that, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Why don't I? Hello, Sergeant Cherry. Is uh, Lieutenant Younger back yet? Mm, not just yet. Can I help you? Yeah. Can you give me a search warrant for Hickey's Loan Company? You run across something, Mr. Dollar? Maybe. Then I'll have to call Frank Pretorius. He's the county attorney. Might take till tomorrow morning. Oh, we're not incorporated here, you know. Not very fast. No. Well, never mind. Look, I picked up this ashtray in Vivian Asher's office. There's some good prints of hers on it. Can you wire them out when you go over to the county seat? Yeah, sure. Do you think that she had it? I don't know. Just checking. Somehow I think that she might have a background. Really? After Sergeant Cherry left, I found myself holding down the desk in the Marigold Police Station. The light snow began to fall, and in an hour, the whole town was wearing a new blanket of white. Lieutenant Younger stopped in, reported no luck, but wondered if I'd like to revisit the murder scene with him. I said I would, and we drove out there once more. Warms up when it begins to snow. Ever notice? Uh-huh. I've been thinking about it all day, Mr. Dollar. Somebody made a real mistake. How's that? They didn't expect Joe Hickey's body to be found till spring. Look, we found it right there. But if he'd fallen down over there, why, he'd have been covered with 20 feet of snow before winter was over. Yeah. Seems logical. I think maybe we'll find out a lot when they dig those bullets out of him. <laughs> if we ever get them dug out. Things in my little town must seem awful slow to you, Mr. Dollar. We're still trying to sober up the doctor so he can play coroner. Ain't that awful? Well, if we... <laughs> Lieutenant Younger fell down. I went down with him. It was dark, and I didn't know who was shooting or from where. But I did know that somewhere along the line, among those people in town, Lieutenant Younger or I had already talked to the killer of Joe Hickey. Turn to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. fired at us did it from the road that ran above the small ledge we were standing on. Neither one of us was armed, and there was nothing to do but stay close to the ground. When I heard a car sliding away down the road, I figured it was safe to get up. Lieutenant Younger was crumpled in the snow, his blood staining it. But he was still alive. I... I got one in the leg and one in the shoulder. Yeah. I better get a tourniquet on that leg. Take my belt. Oh, here, my tie will do. This isn't a very safe part of the country to be in, is it? No, not very. There. Now, how's that? Fine as a fiddle. You think you can make it back to the car? Give me a little help. 
one good thing about this. What's that? Exhibit A is in my leg. I half carried him up the path to the road and put him in the car. He didn't talk much the whole 50 miles to Hartford, where I turned him over to the medics in the emergency ward. After that, I returned to Marigold. There was one place I wanted to look at, search warrant or not. I didn't have too much trouble getting inside with a ring of pass keys. However, I didn't find much in the files that seemed important. When I jimmied open a locked drawer in Vivian Asher's desk, I came upon a good reason why she refused to let me look around. I dropped by her house to see her. What do you want at this hour? I know it's a hardship, Vivian, but it's a hard case. May I come in? All right. I've been floundering around here for almost two days, not knowing what I was doing or where I was going. Well, I can see. Somebody tried to kill Lieutenant Younger tonight. They nearly made the grade. They came awful close to killing me. He's out of the picture for the moment. I'm going to do things my way. As a matter of fact, I already have. Let's start with Teal. You forgot to tell me about him, didn't you? I'm not a walking file cabinet. Did you forget on purpose? Take a look at these. You were in my desk. Yeah, I sure was. What right did you have? Why are you after me this way? I'm after some truth. This is about $8,000 worth of delinquent loans, all recommended by you. What do they have to do with Hickey's death? Nothing. Absolutely nothing that I know of. And why did you hide them? Because I... Oh, I don't know who killed Mr. Hickey. I don't know what delinquent loans have to do with it. All I know is I got scared and hid all the loans that I recommended. Go on. Mr. Hickey started letting me write loans last year, and I... Guess I made some mistakes. Yeah, I guess you did. What do you want me to say? No matter what it is, you'll make something terrible out of it. Will I? You're all alike. You want to chase people and frighten them and make them lie just to get away from you. You're standing here with a handful of papers that make me look stupid. My boss has been murdered and the police can make anything out of those papers. So that's why you had them locked up? That's why. You can believe it or not. Well? I'll let you know what I believe later on. Why don't you get out of here? Why don't you get out of here and leave me alone? I got out of there, but I didn't leave her alone. Instead, I stepped around to the side of the house and watched her through the dining room window as she told her troubles to an unidentified party over the phone. When she hung up, I moved around to the front of the house and took a plant across the street. Nothing happened. About midnight, she turned out the lights and went to bed. The next morning, I began to interview names at random from the loan applications I'd taken from her desk. After four interviews, I quit, because all four parties involved vehemently denied being delinquent and furnished receipts to prove it. I spent an hour walking, talking to myself. Then I went back to the station with even fewer ideas as to how and why Joe Hickey had been killed. Gosh, where you been, Mr. Dollar? Oh, I'm getting some things done. What's that? Just came in. Vivian Asher. Oh? How's it look? Not good. She's from Kansas City. Let's see here. 1940 and 41, six arrests. Conviction in 42 for car theft. Two years. Another conviction in 45 for shoplifting. Six months. And then this. She's still wanted. What for? Grand larceny. Denver police. It's pretty hard to believe, huh? She's lived here at least two years. Well-liked. Straight as an arrow. Well, not exactly straight. You find something? Yeah, She's been writing loans delinquent and pocketing the payments for a long time now. Do you suppose Hickey caught her and she shot him? Yeah, probably that's it. Well, I guess there's nothing else to do but pick her up. Guess not. Do you uh, mind holding it down here? I'd like to go with you, Cherry. Okay, Mr. Dollar.
I don't think I'll take any chances with her, Mr. Dollar. No, I wouldn't. No, sir. She's... She's been acting up quite a bit. Hickey dead. Walt all shot up. Yeah. Maybe she's out. No, no, she's home. How do you know? The car's in the garage. There. Oh. Terry! Put down that gun, you crazy fool! Let go of me, Dollar! Look! I just saved your life, and I want to know about him and about you. Come on. He used to be a, a policeman in Denver. He recognized me here and said he'd send me back. I didn't write down all the collections on those loans. I gave the money to him. How about Joe? Come on, I want it now. Jerry killed Mr. Hickey. Mr. Hickey found out what I was doing and where the money was going. I only wanted to live here and be left alone. Get your coat. What? I'm taking you in. check with the Denver police revealed that Cherry had been on the force there for a short time, then been discharged for conduct on becoming an officer. A ballistic expert in Hartford matched slugs from Hickey's body and Walt Younger's leg. Both sets came from Cherry's 38 service revolver. He was arraigned and booked on suspicion of murder, with Vivian Asher named as his accomplice on a charge of grand theft. Defense account item two, same as item one. Fair back to Hartford. Total, four dollars, even. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were Parley Bear, Howard Culver, Vivi Janis, Virginia Gregg, and Jim Nusser. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at this time when John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. If you like your thrills to be real, your adventures to be true to life, Gangbusters is the show for you. Every Saturday night, most of these same CBS radio stations bring you this enthralling drama that names names, places, and dates in the nation's battle against crime. Oftentimes, the police official originally involved in the case narrates the story. Full of action, bravery, and realistic excitement, Gangbusters brings you new thrills straight out of life every Saturday night on CBS Radio. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, an interesting episode where, and I like those where you have the detective called in 
to a small town to solve the crime, not uh, a situation where they're inserting themselves forcibly, but actually called in for help, because it's a bit of a change from the whole, oh, you think you're from a big city and you're going to tell us how to solve murders uh, sort of uh, story. Although, you know, I think Johnny did hit on something with the idea that uh, the lieutenant's motives might have been a little bit mixed here. Because uh, the situation is that if Johnny goes ahead and investigates a murder and he creates bad feelings and ill will, he's not going to be around and not going to have to uh, deal with it. If the uh, lieutenant goes digging into people's uh, background, then that's an entirely different matter. Uh and I do think that the lieutenant did use Johnny in that way. And I don't think Johnny minded that people in a small town would, uh, that he's never going to go through and probably couldn't find you know, in a few months on a map. Uh, he's not going to mind that there are some people that aren't going to like him, but he doesn't like being used by the lieutenant. Uh, but I do think the lieutenant's overall focus and reason for using Johnny is that he's a resource. And that while solving crimes like this might be uh, part of his job technically, it's not something that he's really supposed to, you know, that he's really got experience uh, dealing with. Uh, because in a small town like that, it's much more, you know, public safety, giving people directions, enforcing traffic laws, and uh, you know, just a few, you know, minor uh, things. So he really was not in a position where uh, he could uh, solve the crime with uh, any sort of uh, proficiency. And so I think it made sense for him to go out for additional help. All right, well, some listener comments and feedback. And this seems to be a week for reading things that I should have read Earlier, and I do apologize, the vacation kind of messed uh, me up and uh, I assisted in bearing this information. Uh, Ken writes, in the Walter Patterson matter, Johnny Dollar told the insurance company that his report wasn't worth much and the widow is still a widow, implying she deserves the claim that was pl uh, paid. However, he saved the insurance company half of the claim they paid. Patterson was originally declared dead from a plane crash. <laughs> And the company paid double indemnity on the claim. The widow didn't touch the money and still had the money in a savings account. Although Dollar found Patterson alive, he was killed within hours. The widow was entitled to the face amount of the policy from the murder, not the double indemnity from the plane crash. Additionally, she's only entitled to it if she paid premiums until the actual death. Uh, the widow would have to reimburse the half originally... Uh, uh, p uh, paid claim plus cost of extra premiums to keep the policy in force until the actual death. I understand Dollar's negative attitudes about the report, but he saved the insurance company money, deserved his reimbursement, and earned a commission on the money he saved the insurance company. Um, that's an I that's an interesting way to you know look at it, and I I think that you may be right. I think we have heard in episodes, I think maybe ones that were in the Bailey area, uh, era about uh, insurance policies that did play double indemnity on uh, murder. And so the insurance company might still be on the hook in that regard. If not, they would be perfectly entitled to ask for half the money back. Think, and they might be able to ask for the whole thing you know, if they could come up with the justification that she didn't uh, continue to pay the policy because she believed her husband was dead, and so did the insurance company. Since they did process the payout, that would indicate there was a, a declaration that she was that he was dead. So I think they might have trouble getting the whole amount back. But, and I, I think that also does come down to a little bit of reputation management and customer service. Because the company might be able to 
I don't know, win on the basis that she did not pay her policy because uh, while her husband was still alive but had been declared dead and force her to surrender the whole amount or to pay all the back premiums. But it could create so much bad will for her and she could create bad will in her circle for the insurance company that she had to deal with finding out that her husband hadn't really been dead and then had the man that she had fallen in love with charged with the killing and going all, with, through all that emotional trauma and then have the insurance company not only come and reasonably ask for the previous half of the uh, insurance that wouldn't have been owed since the death wasn't an accident. But then they went ahead and came after her, nickeling and diming her for premiums when she believed her husband was dead. And how was she supposed to play, pay those premiums? Now, of course, though, it was 1953, and people may have been a little less free with their uh, experiences and sharing negative ones widely. But if I was the insurance company, I don't think I would have taken that chance. Uh, Ken adds an addendum. Uh, he uh, also uh, writes, Thank you for your podcast. I really enjoy your comments, research, and opinions. I'm a trivia nerd and love the background information you provide. It makes the episodes become more real. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we also have a comment this one comes from Michael uh, over in Fairbanks. Michael writes, uh, uh, regarding my uh, top five Johnny Dollar serials, this was a great article, and every one of your choices are favorites of my of mine. Question, though, was Kathy O'Dare in the Nick Sh uh, Shern matter played by Virginia Gray? Uh, yes, uh, she was. She also played the uh, older Irish lady at the start of the uh, story. Uh, he says... I'm 62 years old and often wish I discovered the great Johnny Dollar years ago when I had time to contact the actors and tell them how much I have enjoyed their devotion to their craft. I've listened to about every matter at least several times and was elated when I found Let George Do. Has Bob Bailey had any other works I don't know about? Uh, thanks for the article. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Uh, the answer uh, regarding Bob Bailey is he did not have any series uh, that he uh, starred in that were really uh, all that memorable. And I think the same can be said of most of the uh, guest acting work that he uh, did. Uh, it, you know, when we were playing Bob Bailey uh, material, I, you know, what I do with all the stars is I look for uh, programs that they start in that were outside of the detective genre include them as app extras. And it was always a challenge with Bailey. There were things that were listed, but it was, I found, thought like I was doing an audio version of, uh, Where's Waldo sometimes because he would just have landed some very minor bit role in, uh, a given production. It's like, yeah, he was this one guy in the lineup. Or he had, like, a two-line walk-on role. He did have some uh, materials where he played, uh, like, the male lead on uh, programs that really dealt with kind of light drama. And the focus was on the female lead. None of those actually stood out to me. I think Probably the best thing outside of his detective programs uh, where he played a major role was an episode of Romance from 1954 called Affair at Eden. And he also did a pretty interesting wartime story called The Living Book for the series Everything for the Boys. Anyone ha else has any memories of uh, Bob Bailey acting or Bob Bailey programs that were actually really good? Because there were quite a number of them where he appears in uh, some minor role, but they're kind of forgettable programs. So if anyone remembers any Bailey, again, other than Johnny Dollar or Let George Do It, I'd love to hear about it please send me an email, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporters of the day. And being the first 
Friday in August. It's time to celebrate those Patreon supporters who have been sell supporting the program for six years this month. So both of these Patreon supporters have been supporting the show since August of 2015. Really appreciate that long-time support. Thank you to Haskell and Joel, both uh, supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support. That will do it for today. If you have been uh, enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. Join us back here tomorrow for The Silent Men. And then next Tuesday, we'll be back with a previously uncirculated episode of Nightbeat. And next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And remember us on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.